UFC 267, quite possibly the most stacked card of the year. At least that's my take on it. We're coming off a profitable event this past weekend. We went three for three, clean sweep. You guys know I'm pumped up for today's episode. Let's go. The MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. What is up, you guys? UFC 267. I said it. I stand behind it. The most stacked card of the year. Uh, two championship fights. We got about five fighters that have potential to be a UFC champion in the next couple years. We'll be talking about those guys here in a second. I think you guys know who we're talking about. Uh, first and foremost, if you guys could, please hit the like button on this video. It helps with the channel. It helps me get uh, this channel exposure. And I, this way I can build up my views and whatnot. So please, guys, hit that like button right now before we even get into the video. And, uh, and with no further ado, we're going to jump into today's episode. Um, like, like I said, man, the two championship bouts, of course, at the top of things, we got the light heavyweight champion, uh, Jan Blakovich, straight up Polish power, running the show right now in the division against the the longtime veteran Glover Teixeira. That fight is so exciting. Uh, stylistically, it's an excellent match. Piotr Jan and Corey Sanhagen. We all know that this is the real uh, bantamweight championship fight. There's no asterisk at all with this fight here. Uh, Aljamain Sterling stole the stole the championship title. We all know what happened there. I'm not even going to go into that right now. Uh, Corey Sanhagen, a lot of people thought that he won that last fight against TJ Dillashaw. And at the end of the day, TJ Dillashaw is the snake. He got caught juicing. So at the end of the day, I, th I think Corey Sanhagen and Piotr Jan, it's the legit, uh, it's the legit bantamweight uh, championship match right now so forget about any type of interim before the bantamweight championship uh islam makashev definitely one of the guys we're talking about here that's a potential ufc champion down the line um magomed ankalaev definitely has potential to be a future champion how dare i gloss over Kamzat shimayev definitely has potential to be a ufc champion down the line he needs to continuously prove himself here but the potential that he has is through the roof um, Amanda Rebus, very talented fighter. Uh, Albert Duryov, not going to necessarily say he's a potential future champion. We definitely have to see more from him. But keep an eye on that guy. Keep, keep an eye on Albert. This guy has some real potential. And then uh, we go all the way down. All these fights are solid. Demir Ismagulov, without a doubt, has that type of potential. And uh, Tigger Elenbekov definitely has that type of potential too, man. These are all blue chip five-star prospects as they came up a lot of these guys aren't necessarily prospects but you guys understand what i'm saying as they entered the ufc these guys that have just uh you know really showed everybody what they're about from the get-go i mean this, the skill sets on these guys are absolutely ridiculous and again I, I skipped over some of these fights a lot of big names here a lot of entertaining fighters mac one amir uh etc etc okay guys you know the deal i talked about it a little bit earlier we did go for three for three this past weekend, UFC Vegas 41. We're going to recap that card, a clean sweep for the teller. A lot of profits came in. You guys know I'm excited about that, and I want to talk about the entire card as a whole. Let's get into it. UFC Vegas 41 did end up delivering. You guys know uh, there was a lot of funky stuff going on during the fight week with Paulo Costa messing around with the weight, but at the end of the day, the fight does deliver, and overall, there were some exciting fights in this card. Uh, but most importantly, like I stated, three for three for three on the plays that we attacked, and uh, we'll be getting to each of those here. We'll start off with Jonathan Martinez. He takes out Zviad uh, Laz Lazi Shvili, the the Georgian fighter. Uh, really a cool guy. You know, I tagged him in one of my my posts, just letting everybody know that I did a little breakdown video for this after the fact, because it was a newly added match, and uh, he was actually reaching out to me, messaging me uh, in the DMs right after his fight. 
so obviously he had a little bit of a heavy heart. He's probably on his phone. He's dwelling a little bit on the loss. You know, needs to work on his stand up a little bit more. Needs to become more of a, a well rounded fighter, but a guy that does show potential. Uh, Jonathan Martinez really doing his thing, man. Uh, this guy is is a legit striker, and he's he's grooming grooming out his entire his entire arsenal and his entire game. So uh, a very talented fighter is Jonathan Martinez. Randa Marcos takes out Lavinia Souza, the Brazilian gangster. Glad to see Marcos get a W there. We talked about how she, she's been putting in work for a long time, and she's been battling against the best opponents in the division. Uh, Jeff Molina gets the finish over the, the UFC newcomer Daniel Daniel da, da Silva. Jeff Molina is a legit fighter in the flyweight division. We've been talking a lot about the flyweight division. It's starting to become a, a deep division here. I'm excited to say that. Jeff Molina is some, some real... High level talent in, in the division. Love the work he's putting in, and that takes us to our next fight. This is the first play uh, of the card for me right here. It was a five unit play on Jai Herbert to take out Kama Worthy. Uh, this one was even a little bit more sweet. We talked about how Kama hit that unfollow button on the teller, and uh, that that's never uh, something that that is um, appreciated here. So at the end of the day, though, this was not. This was not a play that I did just to be spiteful. Jai Herbert is a very talented fighter. It was no coincidence that he was a champion over on the other side of the pond. Uh, a very, very talented striker. He really is a sniper with his shots. He's a well-rounded guy. He has a nice frame. Kama Worthy's been getting put out left and right. That's another uh, another knockout loss for Kama Worthy. And uh, he might be getting his walking papers after that fight. So uh, a great way to, to kick things off there, uh, grab the line, um, you know, grab the nice line there, minus 170, minus 175 range, um, had, had action on him a couple times there, and this was a guy that I was really targeting during the fight week. Uh, we move on to the next fight, Jamie Pickett. Jamie Pickett pulls off the upset on Lariano Storopoli. Uh, that's a big loss for Storopoli at this point in the game. I really don't know where he goes from there, and at this at the same time, that's a giant win for Jamie Pickett. He needed that after coming off that tough loss. Uh, big props to Jamie Pickett there. Tabitha Ritchie takes out Maria Oliveira. Good to see Ritchie get the victory after having a tough debut. Uh, Ritchie's definitely talented on the mat. Uh, had some success there in the first round, but definitely did enough to get her arm raised. Uh, got the unanimous decision there. Mason Jones takes out David Onuma. Uh, Mason Jones, man, took some big shots in this fight. If you guys remember, he took some big shots there. Uh, took him like a champ, showed that he has a solid chin there. And uh, at the end of the day, he was just a more well-rounded fighter, used the grappling, uh, used his entire arsenal to, just to take the victory there. Uh, but David Onuma is a guy, I think the UFC will definitely, I think they'll give him another shot here. Uh, obviously taking that fight on short notice, and he shows to have some potential. Definitely has some, some spark in his hands. I could see him putting some guys out down the line. Needs to keep working on his, his skill set there, and uh, we'll see him around. Now, this takes us to the second play of the card. I'm, I'm ecstatic about this this play here. Uh, Gregory Rodriguez to take out John Young Park. This was a three-unit play that I added the, the night before the event. Uh, it was either between this and another prop bet, so I'm happy that I, I did end up going with this. I, I waited on this play. I wanted to see these guys at the weigh-in. I wanted to see what, what the size diff difference really was about. And Gregory Rodriguez was uh, a, a way, way larger man. And not only just larger, uh, but he's a freak specimen. The guy's ripped. Uh, and then when you break down the tape on him, he has knockout power, which ended up coming through for him. He has uh, some some pretty legit grappling that not a lot of people really know about or give him credit, credit with. Uh, beautiful judo throws that he does. You saw him use one here in the fight. Uh, the only thing I was worried about in this fight was the gas tank because Park can go all day. He'll grind you out as a beautiful jab and he'll out volume you. But, uh, you know, Rodriguez was breathing a little heavy. Uh, once it did go to that second round, I was a little nervous, but uh, Rodriguez was still throwing heat and he gets the finish there. So he cash in on a beautiful three unit play. And I almost got it at pick a mods, got him from minus 110, minus 15. Uh, had, I had a couple slips on him there. And then we jump right into the third and final play, Nick. Nega Mariano takes out Ike Villanueva, a six-unit play. That's two units away from a max play for me there. And um, I was all over this play. I think this guy, Nick, is, is somewhat of a legit fighter. He's a well-rounded fighter. But this was definitely a fade on Ike Villanueva. Uh, I think he needs to, to work his way over to the BKFC scene. A tough dude. Uh, some decent power in his hands. But he's not a UFC-caliber fighter. And I hope that you guys are all on to that there. Uh, Francisco Trinaldo gets the, the split decision. Always good to see that. We know we've seen him stiffed on a split before. Happy to see him pull that off. Uh, how about Alex Caceres? Talked with a couple of you guys. This I said that I said this in the video. You guys remember the line was off on this fight. I didn't want nothing to do with it action wise. 
Um, I thought at the end of the day that Choi would be the more talented fighter. And, um, you know, there was a, some weird stuff going on in this fight. Uh, Alex gets hit with that that awkward, uh, the knee and whatnot, but still, you know, stays strong in there, ends up getting out, getting the rear naked choke in the second round. Caceres, like I said, man, this fight right here was, was two guys that were steaming towards each other, two steaming trains, and they collided. That's exactly what happened. But people were underestimating Caceres. I probably should have made it an official play being that there was value there as far as the line goes. But, you know, at the end of the day, I thought that Choi would, would prevail there. So, uh, but big, big shout out to Bruce Leroy for getting the W. Jessica Rose Clark smothers Jocelyn Edwards. Grant Dawson, this is why I stayed away from this. You guys know I usually uh, have nothing but love for Grant Dawson, and I have no problem with throwing two team parlays together. Could have grabbed this line nice and early if I wanted to. I didn't want nothing to do with this fight. Uh, Dawson needs to prove some more things to me before I start seeing his lineup in the minus 500 range range against a guy like Ricky Glenn. Uh, Grant Dawson has a crazy gas tank, but his fighting style really, really uh, puts a lot of pressure on his gas tank. I mean, he's in there just going nonstop with, with the takedown attempts and that type of that crazy type of pressure. And um, it doesn't matter how good your cardio is, man. With that type of style, uh, if his opponent plays his cards right, he'll gas you out. And that's what Ricky Glenn did. Stuffed some takedowns, made Dawson work, gassed him out, got that 10-8 round in the third. Did you guys agree with that? I mean, that was a little bit controversial. Maybe he shouldn't have been a 10-8. I don't know. I mean, Dawson could barely stand up. If you guys remember, Kraus had to run in and uh, try to help him up there. Um, and then that takes it to the main event, which definitely delivered here. Marvin Vittori takes out Paulo Costa. Costa had the point taken away. I don't know about that, but either way, he would have lost 3-2. to two. If Costa would have stepped on the gas early, I think that he, he could have easily won this fight. Um, it's weird. You know, like everybody was saying, it seemed like he was gassing out there in the first and second rounds. But as the fight went on, I mean, the guy was looking better in the later rounds. Uh, so I really didn't like the, the fact that he was uh, a little slow off the jump there. Uh, but beautiful head kicks, beautiful kicks. And shout out to Marvin Vittori for just being such a, a durable and, and tough dude. Um, I still I don't think that Marvin will ever hold gold. I think that he really has to sharpen some things up big time before before we ever see him take out some of the top strikers. I'm not that crazy about his striking. He has some good volume there, but it, there's no real pop on his strikes. And um, I don't know, but, but big win for Marvin. And a big shout out to Marvin Fattori for taking that fight at 205 pounds, putting a little extra cash in his pocket and being a, a team player here. So we all had a solid main event. Uh, shout out to Marvin for getting the W there. So that's going to recap UFC Vegas 41, another profitable event. We go three for three. And like I told you guys, we've been killing it for the last six months or so. Absolutely killing it. Okay, guys. Now, I'm going to throw this at you guys real quick. For those of you guys that are interested in working with me, don't forget, don't hesitate to reach out to me. If you guys are interested in my pricing, this upcoming weekend, this card, this episode that we're breaking down here, UFC 267, I have a feeling that this is going to be one of the biggest cards that I've had all year as far as profit margins go. Keep that in mind, guys. I'm telling you, I got some legit locks. I, I'm doing some cool things with, with my plays in this card. And um, if you guys want to work with me, shoot me a DM on Instagram, MMA Fortune Teller underscore. Shoot me an email, MMA Fortune Teller at gmail.com. Or if you can't do either of those two, Get on Twitter and shoot me a message there, the MMA Teller. All right, guys. Now, with no further ado, let's get into some upcoming action. UFC 267. Let's go. More depth in the flyweight division on the men's side of things. Tager Ulimbekov taking on Alan Nascimento. Uh, we got the the Russian here taking on the Brazilian. Um, a common theme that we've seen throughout the years, and uh, two two of the top countries in the world for producing MMA talent. Uh, Tager Ulimbekov has just one fight in the UFC. That was against Bruno Silva. So he was tested as soon as he came in. If you guys are familiar with Bruno Silva, uh, Bruno Silva is absolutely no joke. Uh, we saw Bruno Silva uh, really getting some big victories as of recently. And, uh, and Tager uh, had absolutely um, no remorse in that fight, man. He was pressuring Bruno the entire time. I mean, Bruno had his moments too. He was throwing some nice leg kicks, but uh, you know, Tager really showed what he's about. Um, you know, he, he, in that fight, he actually had a nice uh, reach advantage and, and he had the longer frame in that fight. Now this fight will be a little bit different here. Uh, keep in mind that Nasha Mento is, is not a small guy for the division. He's five foot nine. He actually has a two inch height advantage. Um, and the reach is pretty much the same, uh, fighting at a shoot box, uh, Diego Limos, uh, Jim over there. Uh, Alan Nasha Mento, we saw him fight on Dana White's contender series against Julian Paiva. 
uh, came up short in that fight. And, um, I mean, you definitely saw that he has some talent to work with. Um, in my opinion, he actually reminds me of Ulim Bekov in a lot of ways, just not as good in every department. Um, with the striking, they're, they're very similar. They throw nice straight shots. Uh, they're, they're technical there. They can mix in the grappling. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I think that uh, Ulim Bekov is better anywhere that this fight goes. I, I truly do believe that. Um, nothing but high praise for me here. You know when you're brushing shoulders with, with guys like this, uh, you know, over in Dagestan, it's going to be a problem. Um, and, and all these guys, a lot of these guys... Where we're training together for this fight card, and that is Islam Makashev, and, and a bunch of these guys were all training, uh, as you know. Um, many many of the guys on the team are fighting on this card, so I mean, I think that this this has all the makings for them to to really run the table here. I mean, these guys are are straight up about their business, and they're all grinding it out. Could you imagine? First and foremost, these guys train like no other, as it is. But imagine all these guys training for a giant event like this all together. You can just imagine what was going on in these training rooms. Um, I think that these guys are all going to thrive on fight night. I want to be transparent. I'm going to let you guys know that right now for the most part. We'll get to each fight. but um, And I think that Tager is really going to have to set the tone uh, for, for the Dag Dagestani fighters here. Um, he needs to set the tone right here from the, from the jump. Uh, Ulan Bekov is extremely tough. Like I said, he'll walk through shots. He'll land his own. He's very diverse with the striking. Throws beautiful kicks. Has nice hands on him. Uh, he, he, I could see him boxing Nascimento up, uh, taking him down, and then really doing what he wants to him on the mat. Uh, we saw Julian Paiva take down Alan Nascimento and uh, and work some ground and pound there. And um, you know, I will say this: Nascimento is looking to be in great shape. I do not think it'll be enough though. We take a look at the live line here. Now let's take a look at the live line on this fight. We have uh, Tager right around that minus three hundred and sixty-five, minus three sixty range. Um, you know, if you're grabbing it early or if you have the right book, you can get it as low as the, the low minus 300s. Um, I think that Tager handles business. Keep in mind, it's, it's a smaller weight division. So not typically as much possibility for a flu KO. So sometimes you, you play your cards a little bit safer there. Uh, I like Tager Ulan Bekov to, to win that fight. And again, this is a guy you're going to want to keep an eye on moving forward. Okay. Tager is absolutely no joke and he could work his way for a run at the flyweight title. We got the extremely polished Demir Ismagulov taking on Magomed Mustafayev. Uh, Demir is a guy that just goes out there and continuously wins 23-1. and one, Only one blemish on this guy's professional resume. Uh, Magomed Mustafayev, 14-4. and four, A dangerous striker. Uh, if you guys remember, uh, Magomed took out the very talented Rafael Faziv. Now this was a fight, if you guys remember, it was an early afternoon fight card taking place over in Europe or whatnot. I was jumping in the shower. I had the fights on my phone and I remember hearing them go crazy. And I was, you know, looking at the curtain and uh, watching the replay of Magomed land this nasty spinning kick. Um, so he, he is a danger striker. Uh, he's a good grappler. He's a well-rounded fighter. He's a little bit muscle bound. Definitely seems to lose a little bit of steam as the fight goes. Um, I would say that he does favor his striking. Now, although in, uh, in the uh, Brad Riddell fight, he was really trying to implement a grappling heavy uh, game plan there. He really wasn't too comfortable for the most part, uh, just exchanging with Riddell on the feet. And he actually got dropped in the first round. If you guys remember, he got dropped in a nasty way. Uh, he's 33 years old. Uh, he's going to be two inches shorter here. He's going to have a three inch reach disadvantage against, again, the very, very polished Demir Ismagulov. Uh, Demir uh, coming off a big win over Rafael, or should I say Rafael. Alves, guy I've seen fight live, a uh, guy I've brushed shoulders with, and a guy that I actually think is a very, very legit fighter, a very talented fighter. Uh, Demir went out there. Uh, Demir got tagged once or twice, and that was good. It showed that he has a solid chin and that he's very composed. And when he did get, get hit with a shot or two, he knew how to close the distance, get on top. Uh, and that's exactly what he did in that fight. Uh, he's not necessarily the most fan-pleasing type of fighter. Uh, I mean... We can compare him a little bit to an Is Islam Makachev, although their styles are different to an extent. Uh, but they're two fighters that just are so technically sound and they're such solid fighters and they go in there and they continuously win. This isn't going to be some guy, maybe like a Kamzat, that, that we all get excited about, that we're making memes about, that we're all you know on the edge of our seat when, when he's going in there. But whether you like it or not, he's going to be a guy that's going to be going out there getting victory after victory because, boy, he is talented, I'm telling you now. Um, you guys know where I'm going with this. I'm taking the Kazaki fighter, uh, fighting out of Kazakhstan. He's right in the prime of his career, 30 years old. And uh, we're going to take a look at the live line here. You know, there's there's been action coming in on Demir 
opening up right around that 260 range. She's already hitting the 290. Um, I think that at the end of the day, Demir is going to be able to to handle Magomed on the feet. That that won't be a problem as far as them uh, in the striking exchanges. Magomed has that power shot though, so Demir needs to watch out for that. We talked about that. He he knows what he's doing there. He, he's very uh, technical with his defense too. He keeps his guard up. He's very safe there. So he avoids that big power shot. He outvolumes Magomed. He gets a takedown or two. He does what he needs to do to get the victory. And uh, I'm on Demir there all day. Kind of a high line. It's going to be one of those ones you got to either maybe parlay or, or see what you want to do with it there. But Demir is Magulov. I think he wins that fight. Hey, you guys, first and foremost, big shout out to everybody that's went over and subscribed to my other channel, Sports Betting Weekly. Uh, it's a channel that I haven't put as much time in as I do over here. And that, that will never be the case. This will always be my main focal point. But again, it is a channel where I will be putting out occasional free plays and uh, I, you can expect to have weekly plays coming to you there. And I will be giving a free MMA play for this upcoming fight card on that channel. So please guys, just go over there, hit that subscribe button. Uh, it would mean a lot to me. Uh, I'm only at 165 subscribers. I want to hit that 1K mark over there as I start to get things progressing. And uh, you know, I, I look at a lot of you guys, man, like a like a family. I know we're a tight-knit community. So if you guys can help me out, I highly appreciate that. Thank you, guys. Taking place in the middleweight division. Uh, maybe the least anticipated fight on the card, but still an exciting fight here. Again, the card's extremely stacked. So, um, But when you got a fight like this, trying to keep pace with these other ones, it's a little bit behind. But Yao Zing Hugh taking on Andre Petrosky. Uh, this guy, Hugh, was supposed to be fighting in the UFC um, or excuse me, he already has two fights in the UFC, but he was supposed to be fighting as of recently a couple times. Uh, the fight uh, kept having to be put on hold here, um, sure, due to what's been going on in, in the world and whatnot. Uh, but Hugh, a guy that lost both fights in the UFC, lost to Cyril Asker. Uh, if you guys are familiar with him, I believe he's fighting out of Denmark, uh, a bigger fighter in the light heavyweight division. and He was rear naked, choked in that fight. Also lost to Rashad Coulter. Uh, keep in mind that Rashad Coulter uh, was a guy that uh, got flying need knocked knocked out by Tai Tuivasa. All right, so if you could take that into consideration uh, or, you know, if you could visualize that. Um, yeah, I mean, Tai's a banger, but to get hit, to get hit with a flying knee by him, uh, you know, th th just saying, Rashad Coulter was a guy I was never too high on, and uh, he has losses to both those guys that I'm, that I'm not too high on here. Um, but again, he's fighting now at the middleweight division, maybe the division he should have been fighting at from the beginning. Uh, I know he's put in some work with Tiger Muay Thai, and, um, you know, he's taken on a fighter in Andre here who's coming off a big victory, but let's really put that last victory into perspective. Okay. Andre, Andre Petrosky was a guy I felt that should have been favored to win the ultimate fighter, uh, when he was on the show. And, um, you know, he, he got a victory over Aaron Phillips looked good there. But then after that, the Brian battle fight was not a good look for him. Kind of showed that he has some holes with his gas and whatnot. He's an excellent wrestler. But uh, he, he really tries to implement that game plan early and then kind of it kind of wears him out. He's even talked about it himself that, that he has to be able to do that for 15 minutes. Um, you know, in his last fight, he takes out Michael Gilmore. You know, Michael Gilmore was a guy, you know, I don't need to go too deep into it. You guys remember, he was a guy that hung around in Vegas just to get an opportunity if somebody fell out. He stepped in and um, got destroyed within seconds on, on the show. And then the UFC owed him a shot. Uh, just for for doing what he did, and then you know he got matched up with Petrosky, and Petrosky went in there, and uh, it w it was an entertaining fight, and it was a challenging fight at times for Petrosky. At the end of the day, though, he did put the stamp on it, and um, but he got that finish right in the third round, I believe he got a finish in the third round, and uh, yeah, he did, and uh, and he had he looked good, he looked good in the later rounds, but just make no mistake, there is a recipe to beat Andre Petrosky until he's proven that he has changed things up. He needs to work on his cardio. Uh, you know, if you're continuously able to stuff his takedowns, you can make him pay in the feet. And uh, at times, I don't want to say that there's quitting the guy, but uh, I don't know a better way to say that. But then, you know, the, he gets to a point where he kind of just throws in the towel a little bit there when he's getting beaten up. Um, and this guy, Hugh, does he have the potential to do that? You know, breaking down tape on him even before the UFC against lower level talent? He's a technical fighter that that has a good fighter IQ. He knows what he's doing in the grappling department, in the striking department. The guy is just uh, not that physically gifted. And at the end of the day, I'm going to take uh, Andre Petrosky a, a lot based on the fact with him having the better wrestling pedigree and just being the superior athlete in there. 
has some good power in his hands. I'll take him to win that fight. We'll take a look at the live line right now. Uh, we got Petrovsky right around that minus 245 range. So if you guys are catching a the theme here, we're going to have a lot of heavy favorites on this fight card. It, it is what it is. Uh, almost a little bit reminiscent to a Bellator fight card, except a lot more entertaining and uh, and not fighters that are rolling in on a wheelchair into the event. All right, guys? But uh, at the end of the day, the pick is Andre Petrosky. I do think that he's the better fighter that should get his hand raised. Be a little bit careful with the line. Be a little bit careful. I told you there's a recipe there to beat Andre. We'll see if Yao Zeng has that recipe and knows how to whip something up. We got Maquan Americani taking on Lerone Murphy. Uh, Lerone Murphy is a guy... That is a very talented fighter that's been really having some success in the cage. Uh, if you guys remember, uh, he had a tough UFC debut against uh, Zubara Tukigov, a guy we'll be talking about here in a little bit. And uh, he ended up having the, the split decision draw there. Uh, that was a, a weird fight there. He ended up starting off a little slow, but he ended up hurting um, He ended up hurting Zubara there a couple of times. It was a crazy back and forth type of fight. And, uh, and then he bounces back with two solid victories, takes out Ricardo Ramos and uh, Douglas Day, uh, Douglas Silva de Andraj. Um, and he's been looking good. He's been looking good. Uh, Murphy is a, a, a very talented athlete, first and foremost. He's very quick in there. Good. He's a good striker. Um, nice leg kicks. He whips the night, the leg kicks in there very nicely. And now his opponent, Maquan Americani, uh, who's only won one of his last four fights. Uh, Maquan is a, a, a nasty grappler. He could sub you with some unorthodox type of submissions. He's a wild man in there. And uh, it carries over from his grappling to his striking too. His striking is very wild. If you guys remember the Barbosa fight, uh, that was a fight that, uh, you know, Americani was was really ripping some nasty uh, hooks. He was throwing some wild shots, trying to take Barbosa out. At the end of the day, yes, he did fall short. But, um, I mean, he's a dangerous fighter in there pretty much at all times. And, um, you know, this is, a, this is a good match here. Um, Going into this fight, as far as their stature goes, they're very similar. Uh, Americani is going to have a one-inch height advantage with a, a one-and-a-half reach disadvantage. I don't really uh, take take too much from that, personally. Um, you know, Mac Wan, uh is just, again, he's a very talented fighter. If he's going to have some success here, maybe he could try to pull something off on the mat. Uh, maybe he can try to get this fight down to the mat and make some, some tricky things happen down there. Uh, we've seen him have success there, like we talked about. Um, cause I, th I think at the end of the day, I think Murphy will be the more polished and just the sharper striker there. He'll be quicker to the punch and, um, you know, it, it, unless, uh, Mac one hits him with something wild. Like I said, if he throws something wild out there, it puts him on queer street and kind of has him uh, a little bit out of it. I think that Murphy will be the guy that's quicker to the punch and, and kind of takes over this fight. Um, we take a look at the live line. Uh, people tend to agree with me there too. And a, another high favorite, Murphy's right around that minus 340 range. And now this would be a fight you would have to really throw throw in a parlay or you're going to try to take a prop on it. You're going to try to take a finish prop or something like that. I don't know if that's necessarily the smart route. Uh, Mac One's a very durable fighter. And uh, and again, Mac One's a very dangerous fighter. I think there's more value here in the dog than the favorite. But at the end of the day, I, I definitely think that Murphy is the more promising fighter. And uh, he's the fighter that's more likely to get his hand raised at the end of the day. So I got to roll with Murphy there. So one of many light heavyweight bouts on the card. Michel Oliaseshak taking on Shamil Gamzatov. Uh, another uh, Dagestani fighter fighting on the fight card. I told you guys, a lot of Russians on the fight card. Uh, we got the tough Polish fighter, Mikhail here. Uh, Michael, Mikhail Lord Oliaseshak. A guy that, that is typically... The smaller guy when he's in there squaring off, uh, he's a guy that's, uh, he, he really has success by just using his volume, uh, his toughness, and, and his quickness with his striking. He's not some guy that's in there trying to overpower you. Although, if you're not up to par with certain elements of your game, with your grappling, I mean, he will take advantage of you. He will take you down to the mat. Uh, he has good techniques with, with his wrestling and whatnot, uh, but he's not a bruiser. Uh, Shamil should be uh the bigger dude here he should be the bigger fighter uh, i know he has a two inch height advantage um you know this is a fight that i really really want to want to see these guys i want to see these guys square off at the weigh-ins this is a fight that i really want to see um i want to see these guys square off i'm trying to say basically uh just to get an idea of the size advantage that shamil is going to have in this fight again though you know Olya Seishek is a guy that's went in there and taken out bigger opponents. I mean, you see what he just did in his last fight against uh, Modestus Bukaskis, who was much larger than him. Um, at the end of the day, though, we do know that Modestus is not really on the level. Um, I do think that Shamil is a more talented fighter. Um, you know, Shamil, 
uh, coming off his his UFC debut victory over Clinton Abreu. Uh, it's funny because he came from PFL, and uh, as he took out Clinton Abreu, Clinton worked his way over to PFL. He's fighting over there now. If you guys remember Clinton, uh, Clinton, um, you know, a, a tough fighter, a comparable fighter to to Olya Sechek in some aspects. Good striker, good grappler. Um, Shamil was able to to land his shots in, in that fight. I mean, he was showing that he has some good accuracy with his punches. Didn't have a lot a high output in the fight. Uh, so I do think that Olya Seychek could have some advantages there if he's able to keep up uh, that 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 work rate. Could look good for the judges' scorecards. Um, but I think that Shamil will be a little bit of of the better fighter here. Really, anywhere the fight goes, uh, not by much, but I but I do edge him. I edge him with the striking. Uh, I edge him when they're clinched up, when they're hanging on each other. I like that size advantage. And uh, again, keep in mind that I'm really looking forward to seeing these guys square off. Uh, so I can get some insight on this fight. This is a fight that I'm a little bit on the fence with. If you guys follow me on Instagram, you always see my official picks posted the day, the day of the fight. And you guys know, I mean, I'm giving you the official picks here. Uh, but this is a fight that I'm a little bit on the fence with right now. Right now, I'm edging Shamil. I want to see these guys score off. I want to see the size difference. I'll say it again. Um, I want to see how Olya Seishek is coming into this fight. Uh, but again, Olya Seishek is, is a, a very tough fighter. That really pushes the pace, and, and he could he could rough you up on the feet. And I think that he does have an avenue to win there. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll see how this plays out. We take a look at the live line here. Uh, Olya Seishek right around that plus 140 range right now, with Shamil right around that minus 170, uh, the slight favorite there. Um, you know, I, I think it might not be the most exciting fight if Shamil is able to do what he wants to do here. Uh, I can see him pumping the jab a little bit, landing some crisp shots here and there, hanging on Olya Seishek and taking a decision. Um, that's kind of what I foresee uh, most happening most likely. And uh, that will be my pick. I will go with Shamil Ga Gamzatov at the moment. We got Zaleski Dos Santos taking on Benoit Saint-Denis, the French fighter. Uh, cool to see a Frenchman coming into the, the UFC. Not a lot of French fighters. Um, we got a couple of them, but not many. Uh, Cyril Gaon, um, is French, Francis Ngannou doesn't really consider himself to be French, I don't believe, but, uh, I don't know, who am I missing? Name some French fighters. Um, I mean, this guy is, the, is a real deal Frenchman here, and, uh, he's an undefeated 8-0, a professional fighter that's making his UFC debut, uh, against Zaleski Dos Santos, uh, Zaleski, uh, Capoeira, this guy, you guys know the deal with Zaleski, man, he's a, a very well-rounded fighter, a wild striker, uh, if you guys never seen his, uh, spinning heel kick knockout of Sean Strickland. Uh, it was nasty. Put him on Queer Street. Ended up getting the finish there. Uh, one of Sean Strickland's only losses in his career. As you guys know, Strickland's the real deal there. Uh, but that's what Dos Santos is about. Um, and, and just to show you the elements that he has in his game. I mean, I remember when he was matched up with Curtis Mil uh, Melender, a, a very talented striker. I mean, he was able to go in there completely exploit Curtis's grappling and his uh, his jujitsu and whatnot. Took him down there. Dominated him there. Got the rear naked choke. Um, his loss has come by way of, of knockout uh, to Jing Lang Li, who we'll be talking about in a little bit. And then in his last fight, he had a split decision loss to Muslim Salikov, a very talented striker. That was a, a close fight. Uh, before that, a nice impressive victory over Alexei Kuchenko, the tough Russian. Um, I think that Zaleski is just a very polished fighter that, that typically gets his hand raised. He's a very good fighter to back. Um, you got the Frenchman coming in here, broke plenty of tape down on him. Uh, you know, w wasn't overly impressed. As you see him over here training with RDA. I honestly wasn't overly impressed. He was fun to watch. Um, really favors the body kicks. I mean, he really steps into them. But it, you don't see any legit technique there. He's not really setting him up. He's just in a very uh, he's a very aggressive, tough fighter that will look to pressure you and whip that, that kick there. Has decent pop on his hands. But again, not really that impressed there. The grappling, I saw him take a couple guys down that were definitely not on the level. Um, he was able to take those guys down. Was not overly impressed with the technique. At the end of the day, I, I got to say that, that uh, Zaleski is the more talented fighter here. Uh, a guy that's already had multiple fights in the UFC. I mean, he's a, a, a crafty veteran in the game right now that has all kinds of tricks up his sleeve. And, and I got Zaleski here to win the fight. Um, let's see here. We'll, we'll take a look at the live line here. Uh, right now, we got Dos Santos right around a minus 185. Um, you know, and actually creeping up, excuse me, this needs to be refreshed. So this is even creeping up to the minus 225 range, uh, opened up at minus 185 there. Uh, so we got some line movement coming in and I think that might've been very recently as well. So if you're watching tape on St. Denise, 
maybe you're seeing that it's not that impressive and uh and people are starting to to roll it's Zaleski there uh, but again this this guy Saint Denis again though a very he's a very aggressive fighter I expect him to bring the fight and try to throw some big blows out there you know th throw some big blows out there I mean this guy will fight for your money I don't believe in my opinion that his technique and his, and his his uh, the amount of work that he's put into the game will be able to hang with a guy like Zaleski. The only other X factor is that Zaleski's 35 years old. Do you feel like he's on the way down, uh, on the on the down slope of the hill? I don't necessarily see that at this point right now. And um, I think that, that Zaleski handles business. And this isn't the first time that Zaleski's been matched up with the UFC newcomer uh, you know that was undefeated. You know The Luigi Vendramini fight as well. Zaleski finished him in the first round. And Luigi has shown he's actually a legit fighter. He's a talented fighter. Um, so keep that in mind. We, we've seen this 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 movie. We've seen this show before. We might be seeing a replay here. Um, we'll see how it goes, though. I'm extremely excited for this fight. Albert Duryov taking on Roman Kapilov. Uh, if you guys remember, Albert just fought on Dana White's Contender Series. I had a bunch of posts about him on my Instagram. Uh, he had an extremely impressive uh, victory. Uh, over Chao Bittencourt, the very talented uh, Brazilian striker, who I actually feels not that bad of a fighter when you really look into it. And uh, I think that Bittencourt was just outmatched because Duryov is just a, a top-notch fighter. I really do believe that. He's a UFC-caliber fighter. Um, he, he was calling out all kinds of guys, uh, calling out uh, Israel Adesanya. He wants to fight him for the belt right away. Um, it, it was a little bit Kamzak uh, Shimaev s You know what I mean? It was... It was uh, one of those types of experiences where like this guy is a legit fighter. You haven't really been able to see enough of it, but you know what you're watching when you see it. The way that he was so dominant with the the um, with, with his pressure, getting his opponent down, just raining the shots down, opening up the rear naked choke. And if you saw something from him in that fight, he was throwing a ridiculous amount of shots, just smacking him, punching him, punching him. And you saw him taking these deep breaths, not in a bad sense, but it, it was... Uh, in a sense that he knew what he was doing. He knows how to breathe properly, okay? Some of these guys go out there, they really exert themselves and they hold their breath while they're, while they're throwing these strikes. They get all worked up and that's how they gas out. When you see a guy that's that composed, that he knows how to take those deep breaths as he's raining these shots down, this is a guy to me that I feel very confident can go 15 minutes all day. Uh, and, and everybody talks about it anyway. Uh, in the gym, everybody talks about the fact that this guy can go all day. Um, and matter of fact, is it, I forget, there was somebody that, uh, that he was training with. They were talk talking about their stories. Shame on me for not remembering it right now. Um, and I was, no, nah, it wasn't Sean Strickland. Maybe it was Sean Strickland. Uh, if you guys remember, they talked about it on the show. Who was the fighter? I think it might've been Sean Strickland, but there was war stories in the gym uh, where, where they just go, no, it wasn't Sean Strickland, I don't think, but another top level UFC fighter that they just go all day and they go all day. And basically they admitted that, that he's actually the guy that, that is the last guy in there that just will not stop. So there's a crazy gas tank on him. And then he's taking on this this guy, Roman Kopilov, who looks like a young boy, but he's actually 30 years old, creeping up on 31. Uh, he lost his last fight to Carl Roberson in his UFC debut. Um, at the time, he was 8-0. Yeah, no. He was undefeated going into that fight. And he got submitted by a rear naked choke. What Duryov just did on Dana White's Contender Series so easily. Um, that's, a, that's an uh, alarming red flag there. I don't know what Roman Kopilov did to deserve to get matched up with Duryov, Duryov here. Uh, I think this is going to be a tough fight for him. And uh, if Roman's going to win this fight, he's going to have to keep this fight standing. And, and he's going to have to to use his striking from the outside, try to score some points. And I think he's going to have to either land some type of knockout blow or he's going to have to try to win a decision from the outside. Um, we talk about a knockout blow. Uh, he does have some of those on his resume. If you go through his resume, he does have those kind of knockouts. Um, I'm not extremely high on his, re his uh, resume, though. If you look at the fighters he's fighting... He, even over in Russia, he was fighting some of the uh, fighters. In the, he was fighting a little bit of um, a weaker scene, in my opinion, there. Um, the reach is going to be the same, even though Kapilov's an inch taller. Not much, nothing crazy going on there. And uh, and speaking of Kamzak Himayev, uh, both these guys, uh, I think that, what they're Bosnian, right? Excuse me if I got that wrong. I think they're both Bosnian. I uh, hope I'm not getting that wrong there. Uh, but they know they're both fighting out of the same uh, same country or originally of course even though comes at you know has the swedish flag there chechnya excuse me excuse me i said bosnia excuse me so it is i'm glad i pulled it up real quick they're both chechnyan uh so albert uh, duryov too the chechnyans are extremely tough and these guys are killers now we'll take a look at the live line we have duryov right now 
as a favorite in this fight, right around that minus 260 range. Creeping up to the minus 300 range. Uh, so it's a line that's definitely moving before our eyes, our eyes, our eyes. And I think that it's a, a line that could even get worse and worse by the time the fight comes around, as a couple of these fights will. Um, I definitely got Albert Duryov to, to win the fight. I think he even gets the finish there. Maybe you're eyeing a prop on a submission for him. Uh, but be careful because he might just pound him out. Uh, but I think that Albert's the real deal. And I think that he's a guy that you could be seeing work his way up towards the top of the division. Fighting for a title down the line. You never know. Um, this division's wide open. So let's see how it plays out. But I got Albert to win the fight. Another tough Dagestani. Zubara Tukigov taking on Ricardo Ramos. Uh, a lot of you guys remember Tukigov having that beef with McGregor way back in the day. He was part of the, all those guys jumping in the cage when they had the brawl. Uh, Tukigov... Um, you know, a very uh, loyal uh, Khabib, Khabib guy, man. You know, he, he's all about, you know, Team Eagle and all that stuff. I mean, this guy, uh, the warrior, he's definitely a solid fighter. Um, you know, he's been working on his striking. He does have power in his, in his striking uh, and his hands and whatnot. But he's a guy that, that really thrives in the grappling department. If he gets a hold of you, if you're not up to par there, he will rip you down to the mat. He can uh, really work you down there. Ricardo Ramos, uh Definitely more so a striker than anything. You know, he's a Brazilian fighter. Um, I've never really seen anything that really impressed me too much as far as the jiu-jitsu goes. Uh, but he has impressed me on the feet. I've seen this guy go in there, throw nasty spinning attacks. I remember one time he was like a tornado in one of his fights. Uh, threw about, what, three spinning elbows in a row. Um, you know, I mean, he's a guy that, that is a, a nasty striker at times. Um, in this fight here, he's going to have a four-inch reach advantage. He's an inch taller. I do like that if he's able to implement his game plan there, uh, sit on the outside, try to be a sniper, uh, you know, work the strikes, try to try to hurt uh, Zubara here from the outside. Uh, you know, Zubara will be trying to close the distance. He will be trying to to hang on on Ramos here. Um, you know, we just saw Zubara in a tough fight against Hakeem Dawadu, a very talented striker. Um, that was a close fight, though. I think that that fight really could have went either way. To be honest, I think that I thought Zubara won that fight, but um. At the end of the day, a uh, similar fight in the sense that you had a very talented striker. He was trying to to work the grappling and whatnot, close the distance, uh, throw some some power shots, and then you know start to hang on his opponent. Um, I think that he's going to work that same game plan in here. I think he's going to be more motivated than ever. We talked about all these guys training together. You see him over here, uh, over there. You know, with, with uh, head, the head coach of uh, AKA. And uh, you also got you know Islam Makachev who's fighting again. We talked about all these guys training together. They're all motivated. And uh, and Zabara again is coming off a loss. So this guy is without a doubt uh, the most motivated that he's ever been in his career. He is 30 years old, about to be 31. He's right in the prime of his career. Uh, Ricardo Ramos still 26, still has a lot to learn. He's a talented fighter. This is a tough fight for him. Um, there's definitely opportunities for him to have some success. We talked about it. It will be. Uh, from the outside, it will be w w with some some finesse type of striking. Uh, but I think that Zubara will be on him like glue. And I think that he could land some big shots too. We've seen Zubara hurt people on the feet as well. Let's not forget that, right? Um, you know, knocked out Kevin Aguilar on the feet. You know, when you're so when you're so worried about the takedowns, it really does open up. You know, it opens up you up to be hit. Uh, so be careful for that as well. Uh, Zubara, in my opinion, is the more well-rounded fighter here, and and he's the significantly better fighter in some of the more important important departments like the grappling and wrestling. Uh, Zubara, right around a minus 170 to 175 favorite. Uh, might be a little bit risky there. I mean, depending though, I mean, if he's able to implement that grappling, but again, if Ramos is dangerous in the feet too, wouldn't be necessarily shocked if Ramos showed up. But I think that this this is a fight that's way more likely that, that Zubara wins the fight. And uh, that would be my pick uh, to win it there. And that will take us to the strawweight division. Amanda Ribas taking on Verna Jandiroba. I love the matchup here. Uh, you know, both these women uh, have had some tough outings as of recently. Uh, Verna, of course, you know, had a loss there against Mackenzie Dern. She was able to bounce back with a nice victory over Kanako Murata, and uh, she got the, the KO finish there. Uh, Jandiroba is a very talented uh, submission artist, a uh, very talented grappler. Just overall, I mean, she doesn't necessarily have to just go out there and submit you. I mean, she could really control you with her position, and she could hurt you on the mat. Um, we've seen her really exploit some of these women's uh, grappling. Now, in this fight, 
I don't see that being the case. I think Amanda Rebus is a very talented fighter overall. She's a nasty striker. Um, she really has uh, a, a, a very solid jiu-jitsu game. This is a girl that's been training since she was a kid. And uh, we've seen her really have some success there. I mean, in her last fight, which was a major, major loss for her, uh, because if she didn't lose, if she didn't lose that fight, I mean, she'd be right at the top of the division working for a title shot. Um, you know, she had such great success in the first round against Marina Rodriguez. She took her down so easily, which is actually why I edged Dern to 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 beat Rodriguez in that fight. You know, because Reboss was able to get those takedowns so easily. And then she didn't stick to it, but I thought that there was a major hole in Rodriguez's game. Uh, she's obviously worked on that, and she was able to get the knockout on, on Rebus in the next round, the second round in that fight. But I think that Rebus should have never even let it get to that. She should have pressured that takedown from the get-go. Uh, but the point I'm making here is that Rebus is a nasty grappler, okay? She's a nasty jiu-jitsu player. Um, she's very strong. And uh, I don't expect John D. Roba to be able to go in there and just exploit her like we've seen uh, against other girls like Felice Herrig, uh, Mallory Martin, and uh, even Kanako Murata. I mean, th th I don't see Rebus being that type of fighter. And as far as on the feet, I think Rebus is significantly the better fighter. Uh, Verna John D. Roba has a little bit of Damian Maya type striking going on, very stiff. Uh, she's looking to clinch you, get you down to the mat. And uh, this might be a tough fight for her here. Rebus is going to have a two-inch reach advantage. Uh, both these girls have the same height, and uh, and Reboss is just a girl that I, that I really think has star potential. She needs to right the ship here. She needs to get things going, and uh, this is a good fight for her here. You get a victory over John D. Roba, who's no slouch, and uh, it, it just puts you right back into the mix of things. Um, so, I mean, you guys catch the the drift here, man. I'm on Reboss here. Uh, I like Reboss to win this fight, and uh, we take a look at the live line. Reboss right now right around a minus 160, uh, up to a minus 175. And, uh, and again, I think that Rebus keeps this fight on the feet and uh, is able to to do work there. And even if the fight gets a little crazy and touches the mat, Rebus should be fine. Uh, yeah, she'll be flirting with some danger there, but I think she'll be fine there. I like Amanda Rebus to win this fight. Taking place in the light heavyweight division, Magomed and Goliath taking on Vulcan Ostemir. Great matchup here. Uh, you guys know I've been saying that Magomed and Goliath is a potential champion for a long time. This is a guy that I've I've stuck behind. Um, out of all the talented light heavyweight fighters that have been working their way through the ranks, and you guys know who I'm talking about, there's a couple of those guys that just look amazing. Um, I think that Mega Med is actually the, the best of them all. I think he has the most potential. Um, I really think that this guy has the, uh, the light heavyweight championship uh, written all over him. I think that this guy is just such a nasty fighter. He's so well-rounded. He's a nasty striker. Uh, I mean, his grappling is ridiculous. This guy can slam you on your head. He can do it all. Um, you know, and, and it's funny. When I see him in some of his fights, you know, he almost seems like he's a little bit of a, of a smaller light heavyweight, but he's really not. I mean, he's a big boy. You take a look at him here. I mean, he's an inch taller than Vulcan. And you know how big Vulcan is. Uh, I do think that Vulcan's the more filled out of the two. I think Magomed is a little bit more slender. Um, but it works out perfectly for him. He has great cardio. Uh, he should be 16-0. and 0. He made such a, 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 a dreadful mistake there, man. If you guys remember, he got caught in that submission uh, by Paul Craig with one second to go. He got caught in that triangle. It was pretty crazy. But nevertheless, just a learning experience for him. And he's only a better fighter for it. And uh, he won't be, wor be worrying about that in this fight here against Vulcan. What he needs to worry about in this fight is Vulcan just cracking you and putting you out. Uh, I mean, Vulcan's a nasty striker, but with big-time power who is coming off a loss to uh, Yuri Prozaka. You want to talk about the, those top fighters I'm talking about in the division, you could add uh, Jiri to, to the list there. Um, so, you know, that that was a crazy fight. If you guys remember, uh, Yuri got the knockout there, uh, and he's just been doing his thing like 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 crazy. Man, Yuri is just, uh, you know, how could I forget about him, man? And Alexander Rakic, too. Uh, you, know, he, you know, he was able to, to defeat Alexander Rakic, uh, but if you guys remember... That was a bad call. I really felt that was a bad call. Uh, and I did have action on Rakic, but I'm not just saying that. If you guys remember, a lot of people thought that Rakic kind of got the bad end of the stick there. Um, but still, a close fight. And, and those really were the, the guys I was talking about when I was comparing Ankalaev to the top guys in the division. I mean, these are the guys. Uh, Projaka and Rakic. These are, the, these are the guys that are working their way up to fight Jan Bakovic. These are the guys that I've been saying for a long time that John Jones wants nothing to do with. That's why he's out doing what he's doing. Because these guys were... were they were going to catch up to him and they were going to surpass him. It was a matter of fact. And when we saw, I know some of you guys will get upset. We saw it in some of these, the recent fights with Jones. I mean, 
I mean, uh, you can't count Jones out. He continuously gets his hand raised. But, you know, if he ever comes back and tries to put work in the lightweight, light heavyweight division, which I don't think that he ever will, he will not want to face guys like Magomed, uh, Prajaka, and Rakic. He doesn't want to face these types of guys. Um, so we'll see if that ever happens. Uh, but back to the point, the future light heavyweight champion, Magomed and Kalaev taking on Vulcan. Uh, now, this is a fight. Magomed's coming in as a, as a hefty favorite, minus 350. They say moderate. I say that's a hefty favorite. Um, in the light heavyweight division, there's a little bit less room for mistakes there. Um, you know, if you make a mistake, we saw it with the submission, but it's even more so with the knockouts, man. You make a mistake, you get tagged behind the ear, you, you get put out. Um, but Magomed has uh, great striking defense. He's very technically sound. How about that front kick that, that he hit? Um, I forgot his name there. The, the African fighter. Was it uh, Bambus? Uh, Adawagla Bambus? Let's see if... Excuse me, it was not not him. It was the other guy. Dolce Lengumbula. Kind of close, but... Um, you know, how about the, the the diversity in his strikes, throwing that front kick? This guy's putting different elements into his overall game. But make no mistake, he'll be the superior grappler here against Vulcan. But Vulcan is up to par with his takedown defense. He's a big boy. He can make you work um, to get him down. He could try to, to make you really lose some gas in the tank there, trying to get him down. But Ankalaev can go all day. I think Ankalaev will be quicker to the punch here. Um, but be a little bit careful. Again, when you're in the light heavyweight division, there's not a lot of room for error. And Vulcan can make you pay, man, in no time. Um, you know, how about, how about this, man? And look at Magomed, Magomed riding the horses here in the uh, on the hills. Imagine you were going to war. You pulled up on a ship and you saw this guy uh, dressed up in some crazy uh, Dagestani attire. Um, I mean, this guy's a warrior right here, man. You want to talk about a warrior. But again, I mean, picture of Vulcan Ostomir, uh, you know, pulling up off a ship ready to uh, to invade. I mean, this guy's a, a warrior as well. He's a big boy. This is a fun fight. It's a fun fight. And um, you guys know which way I'm going. I'm taking Magomedenka live. We'll take a look at the live line. Um, minus 300 to the minus 350 range is typically what you're going to see out there. And, uh, you know, it's not. it shouldn't go out of hand necessarily, the line, even though people are high in Nikolaev. But people also have respect for Vulcan here. Uh, so it shouldn't get too out of hand. But keep keep an eye on it. It could, it could reach the 400 range and... and it could be all up in that in the mix over there. Uh, so it's another another fight where you're either throwing it in a parlay or you're trying to hit a prop on it. I don't know if you're taking him for a finish or you're taking him for a decision. You're kind of flipping the dice there, man, because Inca Live has the abilities to do a couple different things. Um, so for me, I just I like Inca Live to win that fight, and I say that he's a, a future champion. How about that? And again, hey. Guys that I've said that were going to be future champions, there's been a couple of those guys. I said Piotr Jan was going to be a champion way before he ever became a champion. Um, you know, the list goes on. There, there's there's those types of guys, and uh, I've been, you know, not that I throw that out all the time, but the guys that I do say that about, they usually thrive in the UFC, and this guy's doing more than thriving. Uh, but again, Magomed to win the fight. All right, what this fight card was all built around: Kamzat Shimayev taking on Jing Liang Li. The leech, uh, Kamzat Chimayev, man, definitely has became has become one of the my favorite fighters uh, since he bursted on the scene. You guys remember not too long ago, um, you know he's had a little bit of a hiatus now though. hasn't fought in over a year, had COVID, had some some serious health issues, uh, but again seems to be firing on all cylinders now. And this was a guy that really took the UFC by storm. If you guys remember, uh, took out John Phillips there. Took out Heist McKee, easily ragdolled him. And then, of course, the Gerald Mearshart knock knockout where he showed that he's much more than a guy that could just ragdoll you around for 15 minutes or 25 minutes, but a guy that could really put you out. And there's a fight you could pull up on YouTube where he hit his opponent with a nasty uppercut too. He has power in his hands. This guy has power in his hands, and he can knock you out. Um, and the, the more comfortable he gets there, he, this guy could be a fighter that, that is not to be reckoned with on the feet at all as well. I really believe that this guy is just a freak. He's very good at whatever he does. But uh, but make no mistake about it. His grappling is is about as nasty as it gets, man. This guy goes in there and Khabib's people. And again, I, I'm sorry I'm throwing that word around, but if anyone deserves it, this guy does. Um, I know it's not the highest level of competition, but another guy that I stand behind that I say is probably going to be a future champion I'll stick my I'll stick my name with, with Chimayev as well. I'll put, I'll put the Teller stamp on him. I think that he could be a future champion. I think that he will be a future champion. Uh, his grappling is ridiculous. Um, he, he just the way he dominates guys there. 
And he's going to have multiple ways to win this fight. I think that he could hold his own in the feet, no problem. But uh, if anything, he should just take the the uh, the Neil Magny route here and close the distance. Uh, Jing Lang Li is a very tough fighter, a guy that actually had some moments with his wrestling against Neil shortly, but it was very short lived. And um, you know, Neil's a tough wrestler too. But the point I'm making is Li is a very uh, very talented fighter that works on his overall game. He has knockout power. Um, take a look at his last three fights. I mean, he has uh, two knockouts against. Uh, Zaleski Dos Santos and San Santiago Ponzinibbio, two nasty strikers. So he has that type of ability. But in my opinion, that's all you're banking on if you're taking him here. You might as well just take the knockout prop because um, that, that's that's his only way to win this fight is to get a magical knockout over a guy in Shumayev that has good technical defense and a guy that's just a freak. He has a three-inch reach advantage here, a two-inch height advantage, 27 years old. Should be happy about that because we're going to have some some real prime years of Kamzat Shimaev in front of our eyes. You guys know I'm rolling with Kamzat here. The line right around minus 450 right now. It's another fight that you're going to have to either you know, throw in a parlay um, or take him to get a finish. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, though. There was a common theme in all of, of Kamzat's fights. Remember now, the line, especially when people found out about him, the line will get steamed um, during the fight week. So do not be surprised if you see Kamzat's line all the way up to the minus 700, minus 800, 800 range. I'd say that too. Yeah. Don't be that surprised. I expect it to be more so the minus 700, minus 600. I do expect his line to get steamed uh, like it has. When people catch wind that he's on the card and, and people start attacking him, uh, keep an eye on that. Okay. I like comms out here. And, and I don't think that there's enough respect behind uh, the leech, the leech to necessarily keep this line close or to see any type of action coming in on the leech you know and seeing comms that's line drop i don't see that at all and uh you see the leech over here with some crazy headgear working out the neck and um he's a very talented fighter man it's just it's, this is a tough fight for him uh but as far as china goes i mean he's really really holding it down for for the chinese mixed martial arts scene and and at one of the the higher uh the heavier weight limits or excuse me weight divisions um, which you don't always typically see there. So, I mean, he's doing his thing. He's doing his thing, man. Um, there's the boys right there. I'll squat it up. Ready to go. And uh, So, yeah, make no mistake about it, man. Uh, I am a fan of what the leech is about. I am just, you know, way, way more of a fan of, of Kamzat Shimaev. You guys know that. And, uh, and Kamzat, again, the Chechenian fighter, but it's been putting in work over in Sweden uh, how about this, man? The mad, the mad dog, um, Reza, Reza, uh, Reza Madadi. You guys remember him? This guy brought so much energy to the cage. And then Alexander Gustafsson, one of the best light heavyweights back in the day. Uh, his time has surpassed, but um, learning from from great UFC caliber or former UFC caliber opponents, fighters. And that, that's that's great. There's great a lot of knowledge there. I expect comes at, like I said, to become a champion. This guy is just learning from from some of the best and just uh a, he's a very humble guy that that is not just going in there arrogantly uh, you know into the octagon this is a guy that's learning and doing things the right way and uh he's a beast you know listen you guys know i'm a, a giant conor mcgregor fan you remember uh conor mcgregor and him were kind of beefing on twitter i mean imagine what this guy would do to conor let's be honest uh and you guys know i love conor man but this is a different animal here this is a guy that i see taking out guys like Colby and Usman down the line. I see that potential already, and he might even be there already. We just have to see it play out. And this is a different type of fighter, guys. I'm telling you right now, okay? And uh, and that's the pick. I mean, this is how you know a card is extremely stacked when you just have a random high-level heavyweight bout just mixed into the main card like this, and it's just completely overlooked. Alexander Volkov taking on Marcin Tybura. Marcin Tybura is... We're going to check this out right now. I mean, he's on at least a five-fight winning streak uh, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five fight winning streak. Uh, taking out some some very talented fighters like Walt Harris, Greg Hardy, Ben Rothwell, um, Sergey Spivak. I um, mean, he, he's been really doing his thing. You know, he had some tough losses towards the beginning of his UFC career, but there was definitely a potential scene with him. He's a good striker. He pushes a good pace. He does have good cardio. He tends to be the guy that that's really hanging, uh, hang, hanging tough in the later rounds compared to his opponents. To be quite honest. Uh, doesn't necessarily look like a cardio freak, but he's a guy that really does hang around. He's flexible. He can throw the head kick up there. Uh, he's really been just doing his thing with his hands, though, pressuring his fighters, just working the, the boxing. 
And uh, in this fight, taking on Drago, Alexander Volkov, coming off a loss against Cyril Gan, probably the best heavyweight in the world right now. We will find that out very soon. Um, so no shame in that. And uh, he went to decision with him. Uh, lost to Curtis Blades there. Wasn't able to stuff those takedowns. Needs to work on that aspect of his game. But he won't need to worry about that here. Uh, this should be a striking match. Seen him knock out Walt Harris recently. Saw him knock out Al Alistair Overeem. And Volkov has been coming in uh, humongous. If you guys remember now. As of recently, I mean, he, he's cutting down weight to, to hit the, the limit there. Um, <coughs> excuse me, guys. You know... Uh, Volkov is a, a an extremely technical striker. I've been a big fan of his since his Bellator days. Uh, I mean, with his frame, he doesn't really have to put too much power into his shots, man. He just has to, to touch you up from the outside, and a lot of times it, it's enough to finish, guys. Um, again, very, very high on, on Volkov here. I think that he will be the superior striker against Tybura. And again, I said Tybura is a talented striker as well. I just think that Volkov is the superior striker, and I really do expect to see this fight. Uh, take place there uh, for the most part. And that's why I am edging Volkov to win this fight. But just keep in mind that, 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 um, excuse me here. Just keep in mind that, that, uh, Tybura has been doing his thing as of recently and is, is coming in as confident as ever. Uh, when this guy enters the octagon, he's expecting to have his hand raised. Um, uh, but again, Volkov coming off that loss. Um, uh, again, he's so durable in there and good luck. Winning a striking match against Volkov if your name isn't Cyril Gaon. Um, you know, I, I think there's some big fights for Volkov in the near future after he wins this one. Would love to see him matched up with Francis Ngannou uh, down the line. Um, there's, there's a couple cool matchups there. But at the end of the day, I'm taking Volkov here. You guys know I'm high on him. I uh, think he's just a more talented fighter. And uh, we take a look at the live line. You got Volkov right around a minus 300 up to the 310 range. So, again, another favorite, you guys. Don't, don't. Go crazy over here, man. But this card has a lot of favorites. It's just, it is what it is. It's that type of fight card, um, which could be a good thing. Could be a bad thing. You got to be careful, man. You got to be precise with what you're doing. I'm on Alexander Volkov there. Uh, I, th I could see him getting a, a finish late in the fight, possibly. Uh, sometimes Tybura, uh, you know, not that he gasses out, but like I said, his cardio is there. He just, he'll tend to eat more shots in the later rounds. Uh, his guard drops a little bit. He kind of gets a little bit. Uh, a little bit more reckless in the later rounds. And Volkov will be throwing those same big shots. So, careful for that as well. Um, I like Volkov to win that fight. So, we are lucky that we even get to see Islam fight on this fight card. Islam Makachev takes on Dan Hooker. Shout out to Dan Hooker for stepping up, taking this fight. Coming off a big, big victory over Nazrat Hakparost. Um, after the two-fight losing skid against top-level talent in Dustin Poirier and Michael Chandler. Uh, he will look... To, to test himself again against one of the best lightweight fighters in the world. Shout out to Hooker for that. He's coming in as a big, big dog. Uh, Islam Makachev, you guys know the deal with Islam. His grappling is ridiculous. This guy is, is just, he's so tight. When, once he gets a hold of you, he's so technical. You can't get him off you. Um, you know, he could work the ground and pound. He, he's just, he's going to work the position. He's going to do all that. He's just going to win. He's going to beat you. Um, you know, the only time we've ever seen him taste defeat which crazy enough, you know, he got knocked out by a guy um, that's not even a UFC fighter anymore. Uh, came from the Ultimate Fighter. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, never mind. I'm thinking, okay, so yeah, he got knocked out by Adriano Martins, who's also not a UFC fighter. But I'll tell you what, Cajun Johnson uh, actually landed some big shots in his fight before he got armbarred in the first as well. But uh, Cajun almost got a knockout on him before um, as well. But uh, other than that, though, you know, Again, the 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 Adriano Martins uh, was a was a shot. He just caught him slacking there, and uh, since then he's really tightened up his defense, and has just been going in destroying these guys, and really just just outclassing these guys. He's going in there. He's coming off two finishes as well. So you know a lot of people were talking about him being boring for a while. The the Armand Sarukian fight was close. Armand Sarukian's a legit fighter. Uh, the Armenian shout out to Arman uh, Davi Ramos, talented jujitsu player there too. Um, but again outclassed Dober and Moises. And Moises is a, a very high-level jiu-jitsu player as well. He pulled off the rear naked choke, just broke him with sheer will there. Now, in this fight, if Dan Hooker is going to win this fight, we talked about that Adriano Martins knockout. If there's a guy that's able to hit a knockout just like that, Dan Hooker's the guy. Dan Hooker is an excellent striker, uh, training at a city, kickboxing. I mean, he he's a sniper. If he can, If he can time a head kick 
or, or a nice uppercut, he could definitely hurt Islam here. I just think the odds of that happening are very slim because Islam knows how to close that distance so rapidly. And uh, he just doesn't skip a beat these days with, with his, his striking defense. Uh, a very cerebral fighter coming into this fight as a minus 650 favorite. Um, I think you guys know I'm going to take Makachev here. I'd be surprised if anybody's pulling the trigger on Hooker. Maybe you feel like you're getting some value though. Uh, at least you're going to get you're going to get some somewhat somewhat of value on the line. Uh, let's see here. Excuse me. Pull this live line up. We got is yeah. He's you can get Dan Hooker up to that minus. Excuse me. That plus 500 range. Um, Hooker was just in there, so he was in phenomenal shape coming in that last fight. He's branching right off that training camp into another one. Uh, man, can he keep Islam off him enough to to work the the calf kicks and use his striking? Um, another X factor, man. We saw we saw Hooker freeze up in that Chandler fight. Don't be surprised if Islam, uh, you know, is trying to act like he's going in for a takedown, sets up a nice overhand and actually puts Hooker out. Okay, would not be shocked at all. To be quite honest, I actually. Would I would be more surprised to see Hooker get a knockout on Islam than seeing Islam getting a flash knockout on Dan on the feet. How about that? But nevertheless, I think that Dan's only route is to do that or to pull off some type of crazy submission, somehow catch his neck when he's coming in. Because one more thing too. Keep in mind, Dan Hooker is a talented talented uh, submission artist. He is. I know nowadays it's all about his kickboxing. If you remember when he bursted on the scene in the UFC, he was pulling off subs. Um, I mean, this guy, you know, the hangman, I remember when he was a wiry little kid, man. Uh, you know, I mean, he's the same age as me, but you know, back when I was watching him, I was a kid too. So, um, but you know, hooker does have those types of submission skills. If Islam slacks there and gives something up, it's, it's, you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility, but Islam Makachev should win this fight. And, um, you know, I got Islam winning the fight. The line's a little crazy. What are you going to do? You're going to parlay it or you're going to take him to get the finish. Um, it's, it's the common theme, man. It's the common theme of this fight card, but I got Islam to win the fight and, uh, he should be fighting for that belt in the near future. It is what it is, man. Islam's the real deal. Hey, you guys real quick, you guys know the deal, Bavada.lv, in my opinion, the best sports book out there. For those of you guys that are new to sports gambling, if you're looking for an online sports book, reach out to me. Let me give you my referral link. We'll both get a little bonus. And, uh, for you guys signing up through my link, I'm going to give you guys some free plays, I'm going to be there to answer any type of questions you have about the online uh, sports betting game, how everything works. There's a 24-7 customer service number you can call through bovada.lv, B-O-V-A-D-A dot L-V. You go to that UFC slash MMA tab, and you got all the fights right here. Before you even sign up, if you guys are want to see how the lines work and whatnot, you click on one of the bets. You can see what you make per what you put. You throw $500 in comms at, you're only winning $95.24. He's a big time favorite. Uh, you know, if you work him with, uh, just for example, you work him with a Magomed parlay, you get it at minus 188. You can mess around. You can see what it pays. You put $78, you win $41.39. If you're new to this thing, you're checking this video out, go to bovada.lv, check it out. But most importantly, shoot me an email, mmafortuneteller at gmail.com or catch me on Instagram, mmafortuneteller underscore, shoot me a DM and let me get my link to you and sign up, sign up through my link. And once you deposit, I'm hooking you up, and uh, and we're going to make some money together. All right, guys? So if you're interested or if you're just looking for a new sports book, okay, guys, reach out to me. All right, guys? This is a great fight card uh, to 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 grab a new bonus. You're going to get a nice bonus as you deposit, and uh, you can capitalize on that free money. So if you guys are interested, reach out. Without a question, the legit bantamweight championship fight of the world right here. Piotr Jan taking on Corey Sanhagen. I, I really do. I think that this is the perfect matchup here uh, for a man to be holding that strap up above their head and to be known as the legit bantamweight fighter. I understand you could say, well, wait a second. Corey just lost to TJ Dillashaw. Again, man, that fight was so close, man. There was no loser on that day. Corey, uh, Corey showed to be such a, a, a phenomenal fighter, man. Um, he had some, some devastating shots that he landed on TJ. Uh, I mean, it looks like TJ is about to go to sleep here. Uh, but TJ did eat those shots. And uh, and at the end of the day, Dillashaw did get his hand raised, but it was an extremely close fight again. It could have went either way. Um, and, and I think that it should have been maybe a draw, if anything. And I think a lot of you would agree with me. You thought Corey Sanhagen won that fight. Uh, so I think this is the perfect matchup here. Um, and not to mention, I talked about it earlier, but the snake was on the juice, so he loses respect there. He should have lost by default. Um, 
But Corey Sanhagen taking on Piotr Jan. Need I say more? Piotr Jan is the bantamweight champion as we speak. First off, uh, what Aljamain Sterling did in that fight. Now he's been scared to fight him. He's been pulling out left and right. Um, I hope that they ever get that these guys get locked in the cage again. I hope Piotr Jan and Sterling get locked in the cage because I can't wait to see what Piotr Jan does them. Um, if you guys didn't know, Piotr Jan has been one of my favorite fighters from the jump. I called him being a champion back in the day uh, before the Aldo fight. This guy is just a whole different type of animal. The nickname No Mercy is, is so perfect. I remember when he was fighting John Dodson. You know, he, he was grabbing Dodson by the hair a little bit. Dodson was screaming, he's pulling my hair. I love fighters that fight like that, man. I like fighters that are that are maybe a little bit dirty. You can't be too dirty, though. You can't be losing points. You can't be stupid with it. Uh, and we've seen that Piotr Jan could be stupid with it at times. He blew that fight against Sterling. But, uh, you know, who would have known that? That's, you know, that was a whole nother top, another situation. But Piotr Jan is a guy that's just a savage, though. He's in there to take you out. He needs to balance it out a little bit. And he's to learn how to to calm down at times. Like I said, in the Sterling fight, should have never made that mistake in the first place. Uh, he can only blame himself. But at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, when two men when two men come across the octagon and they clash, when one of those guys is named Piotr Jan, the other guy is in a, a shitload of a hell. However you want to say that. He's in a shitload of hell. You can quote me in the comments on that. All right? The guy is in trouble, man. The guy is in big time trouble because Piotr Jan is a relentless. His gas tank is like no other. This guy is in there throwing missiles at your head for 25 minutes if you're able to hang with him that long. The guy gets better as the fight goes. How about that? This fight, The fighter gets better as the fight goes. I think Piotr Jan looks better in the fourth round than he looks in the first or second rounds half the time. Okay, We saw Corey Sanhagen kind of slow down a little bit when TJ Dillashaw was kind of wearing on him a little bit. Uh, I couldn't help but think in my head when I was watching that fight, the Sanhagen versus Dillashaw fight, I couldn't help but think in my head, if Piotr Jan was in the octagon with either of these guys right now in the fourth and fifth round, he would be breaking these men. He'd be breaking these men. He'd be hurting them. Um, I'm telling you right now that this is a guy that's cut from a different cloth. Uh, he's a savage. And um, he's without a doubt the best uh, bantamweight fighter in the world. Um, he's not shy to travel the world, get all types of training. Uh, he trains with the best of them. Uh, you know, He's bounced around to a lot, a lot of top gyms. And uh, of course, put a lot of time in over at Tiger Muay Thai. Um, you know, this guy is just a beast. He's going to have a three inch reach disadvantage against Sanhagen to be expected, uh, a four inch height disadvantage. You know, Corey is a, is a very rangy fighter for the division. Listen, Corey is a phenomenal fighter. If Corey is able to, to hit Yam with the right shot, Corey can take out anybody. Uh, but I think that's what he's gonna have to do to win this fight. Good luck pulling off a sub on Yon. He's relentless. He's very, very physically strong. He rips out of those positions and pounds you out. Um, we saw TJ kind of wear on Corey with, with the grappling. I could see Yon kind of leaning on him a little bit too, but also working in some some more destructive striking. And at the end of the day, I, I just think that this is this is Piotr Yon's fight. Um, I mean, this was the fight that was supposed to happen, but this guy's scared right here. But uh, this, this is Piotr Yon's fight. As the rounds progress, you will see Piotr Jan take over. And I actually say that Piotr Jan might actually really, really land some significant significant damage on Sanhagen in the fourth and fifth rounds if it goes there. Um, you know, if he's able to survive that long, I just think that, like I said, Jan thrives in the later rounds. I could see him kind of getting on top of Sanhagen. Sanhagen's a tricky jujitsu player as well. You got to be careful there with the long limbs. But uh, if a fighter knows how to defend himself in those positions, posture up and rain down the big shots, this is a guy here and uh, a, a beautiful striker. He's so technical, man. I love watching this guy fight. I cannot wait to watch him fight. Um, and, a, and a fighter that really should be undefeated. You know, he really should be undefeated. You take a look at the two losses. A lot of people thought he should have won against the, this first loss. He redeemed himself against that fighter. And uh, by the way, a very, very talented fighter who's fighting over in uh, Magomed Magomedov, fighting over in Bellator, I believe. And uh, redeemed himself in that fight. And then the Aljo DQ, we don't really count that. So this is like an undefeated type of fighter here. And uh, I got Sterling winning the fight. A little bit of a high line. Corey is a dangerous fighter. Minus 245. It's another one of those fights. You're either going to have to take him for the finish. Throw him in a parlay. It is what it is. Or you just attack it straight and take take the limited amount of, of, of funds uh, on the comeback there. 
that's what it is. That's what this card is just filled with. And uh, at the end of the day, though, Piotr Jan gets that gold back around his waist, which is a, a great thing that we'll be able to witness. We made it to the main event of the card, UFC 267, taking place in Abu Dhabi, by the way, if you guys didn't realize that. Jan Blakovic taking on Glover Teixeira. I absolutely love this fight. Uh, I'm a big fan of both of these men. I've uh, been a big fan of Glover's for a long time. I remember watching him back on HDNet fights back in the day before he could even make his way over to the U.S. You know, everybody was always talking about Glover as uh, he was the Chuck Liddell protege. You know, he used to do the little the little thing out there. Uh, you know, he did put a lot of work in with Chuck Liddell's old coach over there. Um, uh, what is it? The pit, right? Over at the pit. And, uh, and Glover is just a guy. It's crazy to think, you know, you would think that this guy was, uh, you know, coming to an end in his career years ago. I mean, this guy fought for the belt against John Jones such a long time ago. Uh, it's crazy to think. I remember where I was watching that fight. I remember the, the bar. So that's, I know it was a really long time ago because I was at that location. But, um, you know, he came up short in that fight. You know, could, could we run the, run Glover, Glover to share his resume real quick? I mean, if somebody deserves to have their resume ran, I mean, was just destroying everybody for the longest time. You know, I had a little loss way early against Ed Herman, but a notable name. But then just running through all these guys, you know, trying to make his way over to the States. Marvin Eastman, Rico Rodriguez, Kyle Kingsbury. Uh, Kyle Kingsbury was his UFC debut. A very physically fit King Kingsbury took him out, took out Fabio Maldonado, took out Quentin Rampage Jackson, took out James Tahuna, Ryan Bader was down early in that fight, hit him with a counter punch. Then he fought for the belt, came up short against Jones, came up short against Phil Davis, top level talent, took out OSP, Patrick Cummins, Rashad Evans, got knocked out by Anthony Johnson. If you guys remember that knockout, big time knockout there. Um, it was what it was. Johnson can take out almost anybody. And the Gustafson loss was a tough one from there. So it seemed like he was having some chin issues at the time, if you guys remember. Um, but since then, he's been eating shots like crazy. And not only has he been eating shots, he's been eating some crazy, crazy shots. Uh, if you guys remember, you know, Anthony Smith and Tiago Santos both landed in the last two fights that he just had. They both landed some big time shots. And it's like Lover Teixeira is made out of, of, of mahogany or like some, some, like tree, some tree bark, all right? These are my analogies here, guys. Work with me. Uh, it's like his 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 head is made out of a giant propane cylinder. It's like you're whacking a giant gas. It's just, it's granite, okay? The guy is just, he eats your shots, and then you better watch out if your, your gas tank's not up to par because then you gas out, and then he takes you out. When it comes to the grappling, Glover Teixeira is extremely polished with his jiu-jitsu skills. He will throw an ar head arm triangle choke on you in seconds. He'll pull a guillotine on you in seconds if you're slacking a rear naked choke in, in no time. Um, you better be up to par there. Um, now, here's the thing, though. Jan Blakovich, Jan Blakovich is a very patient and cerebral fighter that picks his opponents apart, especially as of recently. Um, you know, the, the champion here, let's not forget, man, this guy outclassed Israel Adesanya in his last fight on the feet. That's saying a lot. Israel Adesanya is about as polished of a striker as it comes in the UFC. And if you guys remember, all biases aside, Bukovic picked him apart, man, and beat him up. Uh, took him down a little bit too, but he was piecing him up on the on the feet. Bukovic is such a a a sniper. I've been throwing that word around a lot. There's some guys that are deserving of it. He's a sniper. Now think about some of the big time knockouts that he's had as of recently too. Knocked out Dominic Reyes, Corey Anderson. Uh, Luke Rockhold, that's really when people were catching wind of what he's about when he knocked out Luke Rockhold. You just saw the power, the Polish power. Um, the Dominic Reyes fight was excellent. Uh, it's funny, actually. What's your guys' thoughts on this? Comment below. Uh, Corey Anderson's been talking crap about how Corey Anderson, he beat him the first time around by via decision, and Blakovich's face was lumped up a little bit. And in the rematch, he got, Corey gets knocked out in the first round. W which fight do you think carries more weight, in your opinion? Corey's reasoning that his does is because he dominated him for 15 minutes showing he's the superior man whereas Blakovich just got lucky the way I put it is even though Blakovich lost for 15 minutes or, or however you want to say he was still he was still kicking he was still ready to go and uh he was never out of that fight if it was a fight in the wild to the death you know he's still in there fighting who's to say what's going to happen uh in the Corey Anderson fight in the second time around uh Corey is chopped liver he's stew 
the way I, I put it on Corey Anderson's Instagram, you know, Blakovich could have made stew out of him for, for weeks. You know, he could have separated the, the different cuts of meat and, uh, you know, he could have chose what kind of meat he wanted uh, for, for each day. If he wanted to go for the legs first, you know, the wings, and uh, he could have survived off him. So, I mean, there's a difference now, you know, when, you, when you're taking somebody out. Let's get that straight here. Um, shout out to Uriah Faber that's on that same mindset. You know, he, he always goes back to that against Dominic Cruz, and I'm a big believer in that. But need I digress? We work our way back to this fight. How does this fight go down? I think that I think that Blakovich is going to land some big shots, just like the last two opponents did on Teixeira. The only difference is I think that the Polish power has the ability to actually take out Teixeira, like we've seen Anthony Johnson do, possibly. Or I think that Blakovich just won't, won't go crazy when he lands those big shots and he'll continuously pick them apart for the entire fight. He's just a cerebral fighter. Uh, Bukovic is, is capable on the mat as well. Uh, he's not incompetent down there. I don't expect him just to, to make some bad decisions to get subbed. Uh, Teixeira has been doing excellent work, but I hate to say it, man. I think that Teixeira will fall short in his, his second chance to hold gold. He's 41 years old, and uh, he will be 42. He will be 42 this upcoming Thursday, so he'll be 42 years old going into this fight. It's the light heavyweight division. You could definitely get away with it. Uh, with being an older fighter, uh, the 42 is not that bad for the light heavyweight division and the heavyweight division. Um, not the best though. And uh, Blakovich just has more things going for himself here. And, and I'm all over him in the, in the main event spot. I think he handles business. And um, it seems like you guys agree with me because guess what, guys? The same theme is going to carry through to the last fight. Blakovich, right around that minus 280 range, either going to throw it with the parlay if that's one of the legs that you like. You're going to take him for a finish, maybe. Be careful. Glover's extremely durable. Maybe you take the decision prop. Uh, or if some of you guys think there's some value on Teixeira, you guys go for that. I think Jan Blakovich retains the gold. And um, I think we'll be seeing some big-time fights from Jan Blakovich against guys like Magomed and Kalayov, uh, you know, Yuri Prozhaka, and, uh, and guys like that. Okay, so um, that's going to finish off the card here, boys. But you guys know we got to do a little... A little going out message to you boys. How about since we have such a stacked card, I give you guys a deep message. Make sure all of you guys are letting your loved ones know how much you love them, your family members. Some of you guys might kind of hold a little bit of that energy in at times. Uh, I don't want to say that you're cold or whatnot, but some of you maybe don't express your love to your family. Maybe it's a good idea just to let them know once in a blue, let them know how much you love them. You never know when it could be the last time you get an opportunity like that. So take that into consideration. I know a lot of people say things like this, but really think deeply about it. And um, it's always good to just to let them know. And uh, especially as we go into the holiday season, a lot of special moments coming up. A lot of uh, a lot of you guys will be able to be blessed to be around your family. Let them know how much you care for them, how much you love them. Show it to them. Treat them well. And uh, I hope you guys are ready for an awesome night of fights. Make sure you catch me on Instagram, MMA Fortune Teller underscore. Go hit me up with the follow. I'll be all over the stories and I'll be posting stuff all week. And uh, I will be back on YouTube uh, as well this week. I'll be throwing some content to you uh, by Saturday as well. Definitely. This is a big card. We got to get some stuff going here. All right, guys. I appreciate every single one of you. Hit that like button on your way out. Hit that subscribe button. Thank you guys. Signing out. Teller. The. MMA fortune, MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller.